Hey there, I've been asked um, over quite a few times to say something about sporins. Now the origin and the history of the sporin can be found elsewhere. I will recommend a couple of, or one book at least in the links, The Music of the Scottish Regiments by Colonel David Murray, which I consider a vital part of the cultural literacy of any kilt maker or highland tailor or piper and a very, very valuable resource to anyone else who's the least bit involved with the culture, tradition and clothing. Broadly, sporins evolved, sporin from purse, as in a bag to carry stuff in, evolved because kilts don't have pockets and the best you could do would be to tuck something into a cuff of a sleeve or something like that, a little less, a little less imperfectly secure. Um, they became, originally they were very just plain, they were just deerskin or simple things. Dress sporins emerged very early on because of our cultural fascination with bling. And they would be made from otter or badger um, skins because these animals were considered vermin at the time, right? But they were, the dresser spor, dressy sporins were only worn on rather more important occasions. Although attitudes would change about what constitute an important occasion. Today, broadly, we have day wear sporins, also known as hunting sporins. Um, fun fact, my buddies and I used to, we were in effect an Edwardian hunting club when we would go hunting for deer, grouse, whatever. We'd be in tweeds. It was a riot. Um, okay, the day sporin, the semi-dress sporin that can be worn either casually or in a formal event, the dress sporin, in this case one made from sealskin from the, the excellent firm L and M Highland Outfitters. And lastly, the hair sporin. The hair sporin evolved, it, it was introduced during the period following the wars against Napoleon when the culture and the character of Highland regiments changed. It attracted a new class of officer, one who was rich and wasn't terribly concerned about their career. Because broadly speaking, they were just in the army waiting for daddy to die so that they could become the duke of something or whatever. But they were, more often than not, good soldiers. But the thing is, they introduced, they changed the history and they, they changed the, the outward appearance of the highlands. They basically created the modern full dress that you see Piper's wearing today with a big plate and a huge sport and stuff like that. Um, I had in my website recommended that people avoid hair sporns. Um, I, I still sort of think that. I think that it's it's really your choice. It really is your choice. If you, Again, as if this is an exponent of your personal style, so if you stand in front of the mirror and say, that's how I'm walking out the door, that's all the justification you need. I personally have a bit of a problem with, with chrome, and I have a, personally have a problem with cheap-looking kit. And of course, we all, each have a different set of goalposts about where that cheap kit is. Um, a little bit about maintenance. Now, this is going to be the start of a series Later on, I'll be talking about cleaning these things. I'm kind of putting that off because it's a very difficult and stressful process. And frankly, I'm kind of nerving myself up to do it. It's, it's definitely a pass or fail moment. Now, hair sporns, uh, actually, sporns in general, um, the trick is do your best to keep them clean. They are, they can be very long lived. Some of these sporns I'm going to show you are well over 100 years old. Um, and they, they have a chance, to, they have the potential to last for a long time, but they're also rather fragile and there's a certain amount of care. First off, we try to keep the darn things clean. If you're dining at the table, either put the thing out of the way or for heaven's sake, spread a cloth across your lap. Second, don't hang your sporin by the strap. That is a very, very bad idea. And the reason why is the loop in the back and as well as the, the if, if you've got a strap, or, well, if you got a leather strap or, or leather piece in the strap, those will start to bend permanently into position. And we see that here with a Seaforth Highlander spore, and they could well date to before 1910. But look at that. The, the leather's torn, the leather's stretched, and the stitching is starting to go. Now, I can replace that, but it's not going to be cheap, and it's not going to be easy. So the trick is, when we're not wearing our sporin, when we take the thing off, we inspect it for damage and dirt, and if there's anything in the, that department, damage and dirt, we deal with that before we put it away. Even if it has to be the next day, put it aside, clean it before you put it away, because dirt can attract insects, and then you're really in the hurt locker. Having inspected it, I don't hang it up. 
I roll the strap neatly. And in, the, in this case, where it'll fit, I store it inside this board, but I store it nearby. I've said elsewhere, I vastly prefer the full leather strap over the chain strap. Now, again, my personal preference, I, I don't like the chain. There's a certain BDSM element in it that I just sort of, no. Um, also, chains aren't created equal. This one isn't too bad. This one is rather superior. This is a Gordon Highlander's chain from sometime before World War II. Um, but the cheaper chains, they're like dog leashes. And frankly, they, um, if the links, at the end of the links of the, with the two butted ends, see th these ones, the, the weld is on the end. You can see right there? The weld is on the end and it's covered by the link. But oftentimes, too often, they're on the side of the chain. And if they're not completely smoothed down, which is an incredibly, I would imagine, incredibly time-consuming um, process, the chain, when resting on the side of the kilt, is literally going to act like a chainsaw. I've seen any number of kilts where there's a row, there's a row of... Um, a line of fuzz where the chain is literally sawing through the fibers. So if you're going to, if you prefer a chain, carry on, but you do so at your own risk and your own, it's, you have to make sure you're getting a good piece of kit. Hairsporns are subject to abuse because typically they're worn by people who didn't have to pay for them or, and are not, and are not faced with the prospect of replacing them. The Canadian Black Watch, the two regular battalions of the Canadian Black Watch from their formation up until the seventies, a soldier was required to put a hundred dollar deposit, which was in those days was better part of a month's pay. It was, it was the replacement cost of the spore and plus they put down a deposit for, before they drew their hair sporn, that was put into a Canada savings bond. And when they took the release from the regiment, if they turned in a sporn, which was, in, if they'd taken care of it and turned it in, they got that um, savings bond. And back then, those things earned 7 or 8% interest, right? So there was a powerful motivator for them to take care of their kit. But people, uh, there's a few traps that people keep falling into. And one of them is, you can see, this is a, a replica, a very well-made replica of a Piper Sporn of the 78th Highlanders, 2nd Battalion Sea Force. And this was recently given to me. This was a contract overrun um, for, they, they were required to supply, and again, this is L&M, had supplied them to the Halifax Citadel. And they made more than was required and sold the remainder. Beautifully made piece of kit. But as you can see, it's having a bit of a bad hair day. It's sort of getting out there. And we see all of these hairs down below sticking out. Now, what everybody is inclined to do, they're inclined to pull on them. And that's a very bad idea because this one's made of horse hair. Some are made of nylon. But the thing is, if you see here at the top, you see how it's made. This horse hair or nylon has been folded over and then tied along a string. So if you pull this one out, you're pulling the next one loose. So the thing to do when you get these is very carefully trim it. I'm not trimming into the body of the sporin. I'm just trimming the ones that are hanging below, right? And I'm not going to trim the ones off the side. I'm going to try to comb them down with my fingers or a hairbrush, but a gentle brush. And again, do it gently because if you don't do it gently, it'll start to look like that. And eventually it'll start to look like that. And this is a horsehair sporn, again, that probably predates 1910. And had it been more carefully taken care of, it would have another hundred years service, but I really don't think I can do anything with that. So we don't pull on the hair and we're gentle when we comb it down. Now, when we're, when we're finished it, we've, we've, maintained, we've worn it, we've maintained it, ready to put it away. What do we do? Well, if we have metal next to the hair, we have a bit of a problem because the metal, particularly in the lighter fur, this is Angora goat. Now, this was the standard for the regiments early on, but because this actually requires the death of the goat, because this is skin and not hair that's been shorn from the animal. This is skin, you know. I'm not sure how many sporins you get out of one angle or a goat, but demand far outstripped the supply, so it was replaced by horse hair. But the problem is, 
Now, see, this was uh, made by Janet Eagleton. Beautiful piece of kit. The, the mounts are far older. The mounts dates before 1900. But the problem is, is that if you just leave it like this, the brass is going to start to stain. And it has a little bit. As you can see, it's yellowed a little bit, despite my best efforts. This was new when I got it. Uh, the brass will stain the hair. So what I do is I take a piece of clean, clean white cotton flannel and I protect the hair like such. I probably should go further. There's a bit of dirt there. I'm going to have to carefully comb out. I should probably dismantle the thing so metal isn't touched, touching the cloth anywhere. Because as we see here with this Argyle and Sutherland Highlander spore, which I believe is circa World War One, and I bought it for no other reason than it looks cool, and, look, and it goes very well with my McDonald tartan. Do you see that the discoloration on on the hair, horse hair from the copper or the brass bells lying in place? There's really nothing I can do to prevent that or to clean that. I mean, I could, in fact, in the past I have wrapped tissue paper around the hair and then under the bell just to prevent any further transfer. But there we are. I think uh, I've covered the main points about uh, the importance of cleaning, the importance of preventive measures and not letting it get dirty or limiting the dirt. Um, how, how, what to do and what not to do with loose or wild hairs and, uh, and storage. So a later episode, we'll talk about how we actually wash one of these things. I've done it in the past. It's easy to get wrong, and quite frankly, I, it's going to be it's going to be a little while before I can sort of summon the courage to do it in real time on film. Because every time you do it, there's a chance that you're going to make a horrible, horrible error, or at least uh, horrible consequences. So there we go. There's a there's a start. Uh, carry on. Be excellent to each other. Thank you.